Genesis chapter 10. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. Sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rephoth, and Togomar. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans in their nations. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Sons of Cush, Sheba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramaah, Sabteca. The sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dadon. Cush fathered Nimrod, and he was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne, in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria, and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is, the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anaim, Lehabim, Naphtahum, Naphtuhim, Pathrusim, Kazluhim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtarim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn in Heth. And the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Arksites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathites. Afterwards, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. To Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpaxad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uts, Kul, Gether, and Mash. Arpachshad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber was born two sons, and the name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almadad, Shelef, Hazar Maveth, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikal, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. The territory in which they live extended from Mesha in the direction of Sephar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, you may be seated. And I'm going to have all the uh, children actually come up to the front for their lesson. All right, yeah, you guys can all take a seat right over here in the front. You don't have to, uh, but all the kids are more than welcome to join me right here up front. All right. All right. Well, thanks for uh, letting me read Genesis 10. I know that was a really long chapter. A lot of names, right? A lot of names, right? Uh, How many names do you think we just read in that one chapter alone? Any guesses? What do you think? 50, okay, uh, a little more, a little more. How about you? No, nope, not sure? Yeah, it's, it's a hard question, right? There's a lot of names. Yeah, how about you? 60, okay, we're getting closer, we're getting closer. Yeah. Okay, not, not that many, okay, maybe a little less, maybe a little less. Yeah, how about over here? 78, a little less, a little less, a little less. We're thinking of an even number. You guys are getting really close. Yeah, how about that? 90, okay, a little more less than that, a little more less than that. 70, exactly, all right, let's give, let's give her a round of applause, 70. We, we just read 70 names, right? And the Bible, it's not a book of baby names, right? So it's weird that we would come to this chapter, right, and with 70 names, but actually all these names, right, they're talking about fathers, sons, children, and who knows what a family tree is? You guys ever heard of that, a family tree? Can you tell us what a family tree is, or just give us a sense of what you think that might mean? It's a bunch of people in one family, right? And so actually here, what we see in Genesis 10 is a list of a whole bunch of family members, like cousins and cousins and cousins, right? Now, Let me ask you guys something here. If we were to do a family tree right now, who can actually tell me the names of their mom or their dad? Do any of you guys know? 
Yeah, do you know? Hans and Courtney. Hans and Courtney, very good. Okay, who else knows the names of their parents? Yeah. Justin and Christine. Okay, very good. Wow, that's, I, I don't think I knew my parents' names at, <laughs> at this age. Got lost in a Toys R Us and it was, it was a mess. Yeah, do you know your parents' names? Jared and Colleen. All right, Jared and Colleen, very good. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys a harder question, right? Did you know Jared and Colleen, Hans and Courtney, all your parents here, right? At one time, they were your size, and they also had parents who were your grandparents, right? Do you guys know the names of your grandma or your grandpa? Ooh, you know what? I, I see less sense. So why don't you go back to your parents or your grown-ups, and why don't you ask them what the names of their parents were? Go ahead, go ahead, and then come back and report back to me. Go ahead. Go, 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 go. If you don't know, go ask your parents. Go ask your parents. You already know? Okay, let's let's hear from some of these people. Duncan and Linda. Duncan and Linda, okay. Is it Duncan? Oh, Doug and Linda, okay. All right, Doug and Linda. Good names, good names. Who else know who else just learned the names of their grandparents? Arthur and Jane. Arthur and Jane, okay, yeah. And last one. Berlin and Anne. All right, Berlin and Anne, right, okay. You, afterward, you guys can share with me the names of your grandparents. I'm super interested in hearing that. So after the service, come and find me, right? And I think if we spent a lot of time, right, going back, we can actually come up, each and every one of us, with 70 names of our own, right? Maybe that's something you want to do with your moms and dads when you go home, right? Just going back and listing 70 names, right? And these names aren't here just for, you know, randomly. And I think the cool thing about the Bible is that what we know about these names, these generations of 70 names, right? We only named two sets of people, right? Our parents and our grandparents. But if we go back, I think the cool thing about what we read here is that God is not only the God for you guys, wasn't only the God for your parents or your grandparents, but he was the God for their grandparents and their great-grandparents all the way back to the times of Noah. And so last question I'm going to ask you guys is this, is what do you know about God? What have you been learning in Sunday school? What, maybe something your parents may have taught you. What, what, what can you tell me about who God is? Yeah. God is the Lord. God is Lord. That's right. Very good. Very good. How about here? Um, God made a rainbow in the sky. Okay, yeah, God made a rainbow in the sky. We learned about that in previous chapters of Genesis as a sign of the promise that he's never going to flood the earth again. Yeah. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. Okay. And then let's last one. Who's God? Uh, God could, God is like an angel. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, he's a spirit, right? He's an angel. We can't see him, right? Right, yeah, it might be frightening to see God face to face, right, because he's so holy, yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on who you think God is? Yeah. Okay, we had some really good answers, right? God is Lord, right? God is a spirit. God made a promise in the form of a rainbow. And the good news is, hey, guys, what we learned today is that as we read all of these names, that God is the same God for you. He is your Lord, but also the Lord of your parents and the generation before that and the generation before that. And the good news is that because God doesn't change, he is going to be the same God for your kids and for their kids and for generations to come. And so for that, we can really rejoice that our God does not change from generation to generation. Oh, it's very pretty. It's a very pretty bow. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. You guys can go back to your seats now. Thanks so much, guys. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. Today, uh, we're jumping back into the book of Genesis after taking a break uh, as we were going through a series on what it looks like to live, speak, and serve as the very presence of uh, Christ in Philadelphia. And uh, where we jump in in chapter 10, 
uh, just maybe as a reminder of where we are. Uh, following the previous chapter, we saw uh, God bringing Noah and his family through the, uh, through the flood, right, in the safety of the ark. Uh, God enters a covenant, right, this promise with uh, his people that he would never again flood the world again. And then uh, the end of the chapter in chapter 9, it ends with the account of Noah's sons, right, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Uh, as far as interesting reads, right, um, you probably glossed over as I was reading all of those names, right? It's a lot, right? And even for the kids here who just had our lesson, but uh, imagine you kids, your, your parents uh, tonight, you know, as they're tucking you in, saying, you remember Mr. Victor? And you say, yeah, I remember Mr. Victor. He gave the lesson today. He said, well, let me tell you a really great story about Mr. Victor. And they say, okay, great. He seems like an interesting guy. We, you know, let's hear the story, right? And say, okay, well, Mr. Victor was the son of Victor Sr., who was the son of Herbert Kim, who owned a wig shop in Chicago. And that might sound interesting, but let me tell you about Victor's more boring cousins, Phyllis, James, David, Kevin, John, Brian, and they've all gone to do very interesting things too, but instead of that, we're going to talk about their children, Noah, Dominic, and the names go on and on. Your kids would probably be quickly asleep. Right, kids? You'd probably be asleep, right? Genealogies might not be the most interesting or exciting things to read. And, you know, we, we do get some uh, interesting details, right? We get this uh, Nimrod guy, a mighty man on earth, right? So maybe some more information would have been nice uh, about Nimrod, but we don't get that. And if you know where we are in the Bible and you're familiar with the Old Testament, Genesis, right? You can say, okay, well, you know, uh, you know God has blessed uh, the line of Shem, right? And we know... You know, what's going to come here? Abraham, right? Isaac, right? We're focusing in on one family. So we see where we're going, but why do we need to be here about Ashkenaz, Togomar, Dodanim, right? All these other names we've never heard of, something you would never name uh, your own children, right? Well, all of this does lead up to the beautiful story of how God has chosen one family to bless the nations. I think it's really significant that uh, Moses, the author of Genesis, actually places this genealogy right before we get into the nitty-gritty of Abraham's story, and even uh, getting into the further detail of Shem's line in uh, the next chapter. And it was, I believe it's here for one simple fact. It was to remind the people of their calling to be the blessing to the world. While they were a chosen people, distinct and separate from the nations, they were never called to forget about the nations. And in this way, it's very important that we actually slow down before jumping into Abram and his call, Isaac, Jacob, right? This genealogy is placed right here to remind God's people that, yes, while they were, while we are called to be holy, set apart, and God's people at the same time, the calling is also to be a blessing to the nations and to the world. We continue on in our series in Genesis. We're going to see how the book of Genesis and even the Old Testament as a whole places a, a distinct emphasis, a stress on separation between God's people and the world, right? What is clean? What is unclean? How can you, you know, distinguish yourselves from those who God has not chosen? And yet, God's people were not called to look upon the world with indifference or lack of concern. Instead, from what we see here, it's the exact opposite. See how the line of Japheth is described in verse 5, right? We see that his descendants would populate the far corners, the far reaches of the world, right? And how does the verse describe them as? As the coastland peoples. This, this terminology, coastland people, uh, the coast, the isles, uh, this term is picked up in elsewhere in the Old Testament as we see in Isaiah. As he writes in chapter 42, he's looking ahead towards a time when God's people would actually experience exile and judgment on account of their sin and disobedience. And yet, what we see is that Isaiah writes about this chosen servant who 
would not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. The very same chapter says, Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. Here Isaiah is looking ahead to the time when even the line of Japheth, the coastland people, the people who lived on the far edges of the world, would wait expectantly for the Lord to write his law upon their hearts. Because even there in the most remote parts of the regions where Japheth and his sons dwell, this is where God would go and reach and assemble the full number of his people. And so here we see in the Old Testament that, yes, while there is a specific concern for one line, chosen family, individuals, yet this does not discount God's concern for what he is doing in the world. Look at verse 21. How does Moses, as he writes this, describe the line of Shem? To Shem also, the father of all children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth. Here we see Shem and Japheth actually tied together in some kind of way. I don't think that that mention is completely random, but in a sense, there is that tie together as brothers to show that, yes, while these descendants will go off and settle in the coastlands far, yes, while the line of Shem has been chosen to be blessed, right? While this is its truth, while this is all true, in the grand scheme of the Lord's plan, he had always intended to draw from to himself people from all nations, people of different languages, tongues, people who look different from you and I. And for us this morning, I believe that just as this was a reminder for its original readers and the early church to have a concern for the nations, this is also a a great reminder for us today. This is an encouragement to look upon the world, right? Right? Have care for the nations, right? This is something that we ought to be constantly reminding us ourselves of and asking ourselves, what does it look like for us, the church, God's people, a people who are called to be holy, righteous, set apart, and distinct from all those around us? What does it look like for us to reckon with this fact that while we don't belong here, we are not called to ignore this place either? We're not called to ignore our neighbor. What does it look like for us as Christians to have a distinct concern for the world and city around us? Because Christians and the church, I believe, are not only called to be a blessing, but we're the only ones truly, I believe, that can really address the actual needs for the lost, the broken, and the helpless. While the world may offer physical help to those in need, which is often needed, and oftentimes uh, the church is at the forefront of this. Although this is the case, we as Christians, we as God's chosen people, we should be at the forefront in providing help, in directing the help, in identifying the needs of this world and in our city, because we're able to see this world very differently than the world does. Unlike the rest of the world, we're able to see the deep dignity that all men were created with as made in the image of God. And so our hearts among all people should break the most when we see injustices of race, of class, of inequality in our city. And we seek to end these things not and have a concern not for equality's sake itself or just for fairness itself, but instead because we recognize that this is not what the Lord intended. And we see that here in Genesis 10, that the God's heart and concern are for those who are far off. And I love that we are preaching this sermon right after a series on live, speak, and serve as the very presence of Christ. Because I think this first point for our sermon this morning is a natural application of what we've looked at in the past five weeks. What does it look like to serve and be that very presence of Christ? Not just to us, brothers and sisters in Christ here in the church, but to the city around us. Our call is to love those and have a care and concern that others do not have. And for the kids here too, this call is for you as well. As much as you love your 
your immediate family, your mom, your dad, as we talked about, and your brothers and sisters, and maybe other Christians here in the church, you also, kids, should have a distinct care. You should also love and care for those around you in your schools, at your daycares, in your playgroups. But your call is to love them and to be a blessing to them. Following this uh, description of Japheth's sons and descendants who uh, ended up settling in the furthest parts of the world, right? We, we then come to Ham's line, a line that we remember is cursed, right? We see this in Genesis 9 when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had did, done to him. He said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. So we, uh, we come to this cursed line and we should expect, I don't know, cursed things, right? <laughs> but two things we see here that deviate from the standard formula of just father, son, these are the children, right? Two things. First, we see this uh, description uh, about Nimrod, right? How he was this uh, really, really strong guy, right? A mighty man and a mighty hunter, right? And uh, if I were to ask the kids again, when, you, when I say hunter, what do you think of? They might say, uh, I don't know, uh, deer, quail. I've never been hunting, so I'm just guessing here what, what people hunt. Uh, you know, you guys hunt. Some of you hunt. I know you guys hunt, so you, know, you can fill in the blanks there, right? But what we see in verse 10 is that not only is Nimrod a conqueror of animals, I'm guessing, right? Uh, but he's also a conqueror of men. Right? He's a conqueror, a hunter of men in every sense, right? He conquers and establishes a kingdom, right? Names that, you know, we go through this list and you're like, I've never heard of these names. But as soon as we come to Nimrod and his kingdom, he's like, ah, I've heard of these names. Babel, which would eventually become Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, right? Yeah, we know these names, right? World powers. Here is this man, Nimrod, who's established this kingdom. He became so powerful. He he became a proverb, right? So, so they would say, you know, they, someone's lifting something heavy and or, I don't know, doing hunter things. And they say, wow, look at them. Like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, right? It's, uh, we have memes. They had Nimrod. And so, you know, that's what they <laughs> compared him to in a good way, right? The good memes. Okay. Um, after this description of Nimrod, right, we see Canaan. Verse 19, a description of the territory of the Canaanites. And uh, without going into too much detail, um, if you read through the Old Testament, uh, you know, and you say, wow, you know, actually Canaan, wasn't, wasn't, that, wasn't that the promised land? Wasn't, wasn't that like the really, really good land? If that's what you were thinking, you're absolutely right. Here's Canaan who receives choice land. Right, fertile land, land that's described in Exodus and Numbers as a land flowing with milk and honey, right? It's good location, right, access to both the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. Right? It, was, it was overall a very good place to be. And we read this and we say, okay, well, good for Ham, good for Ham's line, right? Celebrities, good land, good home. You might imagine how God's people might feel Right, reading this or hearing this and saying, oh, great, right? No one likes to be compared to their more successful cousins, right, growing up as a kid. I don't know if your parents ever did that. Or why can't you be like him? He does better in school than you. He's taller than you. So, well, I can't, I, can't, I can't control that, Mom. I'm sorry. I can't control my height, right? But no one likes to be compared, right? And, and we're talking about uh, this guy Nimrod. He was, this guy's famous, right? It's not some sort of local recognition, right? It's, it's an international recognition, not kind of a local fame like, uh, like you see Walkworks open up in a, right, a location on Frankfurt, and you're like, wow, go for Walkworks, right? My favorite food truck now has a store, and then outside of Philadelphia, no one has any idea what Walkworks is, right? It's nothing like that, but this is something, this was a man who was made into a proverb, international fame. Right, you have choice land. And in comparison, when we look at Shem's line, the only deviation we get there in verse 25, to Eber was born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Well, this is a contrast that we might not expect. What we see here in Genesis 10, I think, is demonstrating something again for us. 
It shows us that the absence of natural material blessings does not mean the absence of God's blessing in our lives. There are those in this world who spend their whole lives apart from our Lord, who gain and accumulate much earthly success, influence, and wealth, all without having this true blessing from the Lord. A sure foundation to set their feet upon, to endure in this life, looking ahead for what's to come in the next life. And this is how it's been since the time of the fall. And we look around us, and I know personally, in the lives of all of our families, we've experienced hardship. Loved ones fall sick and pass away. We experience injustices in our workplace, and our families. And in short, it just seems like bad things happen to good people. And only good things happen to those who are wicked We lament along with the psalmist in Psalm 73 when he confesses, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. But as we see here in Genesis 10, and as the psalmist realizes at the end of Psalm 73 that our salvation, our true blessing, doesn't mean that We're going to go through life unscathed, free from hardship. But instead, our salvation means that we are actually able to endure in this life with anything that it gives us. With the same confidence that the psalmist writes, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Through this blessing that we have in Jesus, we have a true hope for what's to come, a hope that serves as a present refuge in times of need. While present earthly and material blessings aren't anything to hate or despise or think of worthless But to be chosen and loved by God is so much better than anything that this world, that this life has to offer. As we conclude our time this morning and as we continue to think about how uh, these three lines are presented, I think it's actually quite, quite nice, right? It's actually, I like it that all the spectacular people and all the good stuff doesn't fall to the chosen blessed line of Shem. In this way, I think it speaks volumes to who is qualified to receive this kind of grace and blessing from God. Why Shem's line? Why did the Lord choose this line that would eventually produce Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and eventually our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of this world? And we look ahead in Scripture, and it's clear that Shem's line is not without sin. Abraham came from a long line of idolaters. Abraham was not loved because he was righteous. Instead, he was made righteous because he was loved by God. For us this morning, for those of you who may not be a Christian or have received this grace and blessing, this message is for you, just as it is for those who have received. That You don't need to be someone noteworthy or have it all together or have earned your way up in some way to make yourself shinier or more spectacular in the sight of the Lord. Instead, this grace comes to each and every one of us, unmerited, uh, wholly undeserving. And this morning, we need to hear this again and again. So we often forget that this grace that we have received is so undeserved. And it treats, it affects the way we treat the world. It affects the way that we treat the nations. A natural application point of have a concern for the world, for your neighbor. As soon as we think that we deserve this grace from God, that this blessing is somehow something that, yes, we worked towards or we somehow worked our way to, then that first application is completely useless. Instead, every day we need to remind ourselves of where this blessing comes from, how it was given, why we deserve it. And the answer is we don't, not at all. And yet God chose to love each and every one of us here who have received this grace by faith alone. 
And as we look around at the world around us and its brokenness, as we look and seek to be a good neighbor, to have a concern for our neighbors, to restore good order that God so seeks in his grace, it encourages us more and more to pray that God is not done in the lives of our family members, in the lives of the non-Christian on our block, in the lives of those in different countries, that the Lord is not finished. And just as this unmerited grace has come to us, so too God can be working in the hearts of those that we might not see it. And this is a grace that we need every single day to remind us and just to be in awe of who God is and his great love for his people. As we conclude and come and Join together in this meal of the Lord's Supper. Let's remember this grace. Let us remember this grace that God has given to us and rejoice in it. And be encouraged and be challenged to see this world differently, to see our neighbor in a different way and have a heart and concern for them just as God has a heart and concern for us. Amen.